allow me to introduce this word management from a different perspective. Recently, I was com uh, confronted with the term pain management. As a kid, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, every one of you, I experienced different form of pain. In the first and the second grade, we had a teacher who enjoyed correcting our unruly behavior by pulling our sideburns and chewing. At the time, I thought there is no greater pain than somebody pulling your hair. Yes. On a short parenthesis, what do they call sideburns in English? Anybody know? That is, that's a trivia question. It's true. It's true. Yeah, yeah, why do they call it sideburns? It has nothing to do with the burn per se. It is on the side, and it doesn't have anything with the burn. So I looked it up just because I was curious about it. And it turns out to be a name after an American Civil War general, which name was Ambrosi. Burnside, which for the first time he, he would shave the beard off, but he would leave the sideburns for Chuni to grow and join him with the mustache. And he created a very unique image that stuck in time. So ever since that was that part of the hair was called a sideburns, and that, that name stuck. Another type of pain that later I found rather excruciating was the dental pain, to read it myself. As I grew up, I started having those pains. And uh, I tell you what, I will not wish to anybody that type of pain. I'm sure some of you experienced, some of, some of you may not, but that's, that's a excruciating pain. Of course, we evolved and so did the pain. Some 21 years ago, I moved to the United States and I started having low back pain. And when I say low back pain, I'm talking about the pain that even blinking your eyes will trigger the pain in your low back. Extremely excruciating. Time goes on. The last, and I hope, really, I hope the last type of pain that I experienced, it was the kidney release stone, kidney stone release pain. I was in the hospital in, 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 uh, about two weeks ago, and everybody is trying to call me, is trying to come and see me. Guys, I invite you to come and see me when I do well. But when I'm in pain, please leave me alone. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to see absolutely nobody. I am very moody and I'm very unruly when, when I'm in pain. Uh, then in the emergency room at Baylor, the doctor was sitting in front of me and rather pathetically looks at me and turns to the nurse and said, we're gonna put him on pain management, on pain management. And I immediately inquired, what exactly is pain management? I need to know. I said, whatever you do, just make the pain go away. I don't care what you do, call it whatever you want to call it, but just make the pain go away. And the nurse told me something very interesting. We just cannot do that. Pain has or is accompanied by certain indicators that we need to know about you. We cannot just put you asleep that you will not feel pain. In order to fairly and accurately establish a diagnosis, we have to alleviate the pain, but we still have to follow certain indicators that the pain gives. And that, following those indicators, is called pain management. Now, I made this uh, parallel because in the church, 
in a non-profit corporation. There are certain indicators that we have to follow. That's what we call management of the church. So we're going to look for the next uh, hour or so, we're going to look to see on what those indicators are. The second component besides addressing the problem is creating avoidance strategy that in the future we do not repeat the past. So if we do get in trouble, we have church management means looking at the trouble and learn from those problems, from those troubles that in the future we create a, a avoidance strategies that will not repeat the past, learning from the past. And of course, the third component is generate development and growth for the church, mission, corporation, either way you like it. I want to make a, 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 an important disclaimer before somebody will, will start throwing stones at me. During this class, we are not talking about the spiritual side of the church. We are only talking about the administrative and the management of the corporation. So we're not talking about spiritual side because as soon as I start digging into the concepts uh, uh, presented in the book, some might say, well, what is the prayer? What is the fasting? What is invoking the power of the Holy Spirit? All those are valid components, absolutely valid and vital for a corporation, for a church, for a mission. But uh, those components are not part of this class. Unless so somebody else, another time, another occasion, we talk about that. Now, this church management, another disclaimer, it's, it's way too vast to be uh, discussed in two hours. So this book that I'm presenting, it's a book that is presented at the master's level that takes about three months, a full semester. Going to school every day or twice a week. So it's, it's very, the subject is vast. So what we're doing over here is just skimming the concept, just skimming the concept, just take take the most important concepts and talk about them. I was in vacation about three weeks ago and driving back from Florida, I couldn't help but look on the side of the road. And uh, on the billboards, on those big commercial boards on the side of the highway, you see advertisements and you see advertising for HVAC for uh, uh, companies. Uh, you see advertising for certain legal services. And uh, just to pass time, I started asking my wife, what are those dot something or comma something mean? So she started explaining me that an LLC means a limited liability company. And then we went to, uh, to Mississippi and I've seen there, there was a PLLC. I said, well, what is the PLLC? Well, that is a professional limited liability company, but she's eager to tell me, don't get too excited because in Texas, we do not have PLLC. So it looks like at the state level, there are different laws to form these corporations. And if you to take the entire spectrum of corporations that are incorporated in the United States. You could divide it into two main categories. One category is the for-profit corporation in which money is the, 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 the driving factor. Making money is the driving factor for which those corporations exist. And uh, in, uh, within for-profit corporations, you have that Inc, the big Nokia, for example, that Inc, it's a, it's a corporation. You have the, like I mentioned, LLC, PLLC, LP, limited partnership, is that correct? All right, you have the PC, or I works for a, a, a company that does a tax and auditing, and they have PC, it's a professional company. 
Uh, professor, Cor professor Corporation. Thank you. Man. Then you have the not for profits, which are also called the tax exempt corporation. And in, in these corporations, you have different government entities. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys knew or not, but the city properties are tax exempt. They do not pay taxes for the for the for their properties. All right. Then you have the ISDs, the school district. Some back a hundred years ago, they decided to separate that from the government and they have their own form of government. So uh, they broke away from the .gov corporations. They had their own form of government. They elect their own government. They elect their own board of trustees. Also, ISDs are tax exempt. They do not pay taxes for their properties. Then, of course, you have churches, you have charitable uh, corporations or charitable entities, and you have private foundations. Um, I'm not sure if Elena is going to touch this or not, but there is a difference between a church and a private foundation. And basically, for a church to be considered a tax exempt entity, a certain percentage of funding has to come from outside. Cannot count. What is that? Percentage? That's public. Thirty-three point three percent. That's public charity. So public charity has to be thirty-three point three percent, which one third has to come from outside. In other words, you cannot create a corporation called a church in which only the board of directors are part of the financing of the church because you're missing the public component of it, which has to come from outside, from the public has to come. If you do create a corporation, call it church, call it whatever you want to do, and doesn't meet this criteria, that turns into a private foundation, which are entirely different. Rules. Bill Gates, for example, foundation, it's a foundation because he is the main contributor. Uh, there are many more, many others. Uh, Hillary Clinton Foundation or the Clinton Foundation also uh, are registered as a private foundation. Those are examples of foundations. Let's draw close to our, our uh, uh, subject today. One might ask, are there any biblical connections between church and businesses? You know, church, ultimately, the God or the church is God's, is not ours. And as such, he will defend it himself. Is it not true? What do we care? We just need to glorify God and he will take care of the rest. Is that a good statement? Let's open up the Bibles at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. And the Bible says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So do we need leaders to manage church's affairs? Yes, the answer is the verse above. Jesus needed Peter as a rock. Now, also, Jesus needs David, John, Simi, Ovi, Jorge, so on and so forth. Now, we're not talking about the foundation here. The foundation is already being laid. But we are called to build on the existing foundation. And that uh, 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 could be this John, David, uh, Simi, could be bricks, could be switches could be light switches could be uh, lights themselves in the building everybody has its own its own function in the church so how does glorifying god 
But what does glorifying God have anything to do with uh, being financially sad? First Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? How can he take care of God's church? The definition in the uh, quest to, to search for this biblical background of the church and, and corporation, they come up with a definition in the book calls it the following. God and business do mix. And profit is the standard for determining the effectiveness of our combined efforts. So they talk about profit in a not-for-profit corporation. For us, the common link between God and profit is people. Is people. So profit equals people in a not-for-profit corporation. The success of a church is measured in its people. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 to 12. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have a great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you, to share in the inheritance of his holy people, the kingdom of light. There are several principles that spring out from this passage alone. First of all, there's the prayer. We cannot do anything without praying. Then involves knowledge of his will, knowledge of God's will, wisdom and understanding that only the spirit gives then bearing fruit, being fruitful in every good work, and growing again in knowledge of God. But don't be misled by this. In the ministry, you have to have great endurance and patience. Now we know that our God is a God of good. A good principle would be if you see somebody doing or taking actions against the church, they are meant to create disorder. It doesn't matter at what scale, there is a good indication that that person is not inspired by God already by the devil. The devil likes disorder. God is a God of order. He has made the flora and the fauna, everything that we see around us. And what he made, he said, those are good. And then as a crown of his achievement, a crown of his creation, he made a human being. And he said it was very good. It was very good. So God has called us to be head, not tail. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commandments, to the commandments of the Lord, your God, then I will give you this day and carefully follow them. You will always be on the top, never at the bottom. Never at the bottom. The quest of finding the biblical background is satisfied by many verses. We mentioned several of them, but there are many, many more. To strive for excellence, to strive for order, for, to strive for a good management in the church. Now, moral background.
a leader that has issues managing his personal life or his personal finances, it is very, very unlikely that he'll do a good job managing church's affairs. How can you imagine a leader, and I want to detach myself from the reality for a moment, because I don't want to speak against people that I know, right? But I'm telling you what the book presents, nothing else, nothing more. How can you, how can you ask for a bankrupt leader, being pastor, being deacon, being presbyter, any of the church leaders, the elder in the church, that has repeated financial issues in his personal life, has repeated bankruptcies for his businesses. Every time, every, everything he touches, he demolishes and he brings down. How can you imagine such a leader standing in front of the church and giving sound advice about church management, church finances, about church giving? Imagine such a leader standing in front of the congregation and reading Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in, the, in my house. Test me in this, said the Lord Almighty, and you will see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room for you to store it. There is always a balance between aggressive investment and withdraw back from any investment. There is always a balance. The book says that going fast is only good if the road is straight. A good driver reads the road ahead, reads the signs, in our case, reads the symptoms, and breaks He's the break before the turn to avoid an accident. Thomas Jefferson said it so much, so, so nicely. He said, trust no man with too much power. Bind them with the chains of the Constitution. Bind them with the chains of the Constitution. That's Thomas Jefferson. The book contains many uh, secular concepts that the, the business uh, runs by. And like I said, the book manages somehow to point everything towards a biblical perspective. The authors of the books were Christians. The authors of the book, the book did collaborate and consult with the best businesses that were run by Christian folks. And I'm talking about Procter & Gamble. Uh, I'm talking about businesses like churches, in fact, like uh, Willow Creek Church or uh, uh, the, our brother from California with the Purpose Driven Life, Saddleback Church. There are so many references to this, these entities. Johnson & Johnson is another, another uh, company that at one time at least had Christian uh, leadership at one time. So the decision that led to the selection and inclusion of this principle has been taken after extensive consultation with a multitude of ministry workers after seeking the will of God in prayer, and after carefully studying the will of God, especially the passages that refer to stewardship and to the investment strategies. The book's objective is to create a framework in which you could identify and state the operating mission. I cannot talk enough about this. It's very important to have an operating mission as a corporation, as a mission. To observe 
and quantify the progress. So many of us nowadays, we function because it's an inertia and we've been given something and we want to keep it the way it is and preserve the status quo. But a good management of the corporation will observe and will quantify the progress to take the corporation from where it's at right now, identify where you want to be and take that corporation from point A to point B. Also, one of the purposes of this book and this class is to acquire, uh, acquire knowledge, not to know everything about the financial statements, because uh, you cannot learn about financial statements in, in a one hour or two hours, or for that matter, in, in three months. It takes a lot more training uh, to, to, to do that. But we at least hope we acquire knowledge to ask the correct questions when it comes to financial statements. And somewhere in the book says that the pastor of the church or the leader of the church doesn't have to know in that accounting, already he has to know what questions to ask the accountant. Also, we hope to recognize the symptoms, state the mission and solve the mission's problem. The book says, and I liked this uh, uh, citation from the book, says a problem well stated is a problem help, half solved. A problem well stated is a problem half solved. And of course, we'll uh, talk a little bit about quantify the employee's performance. One of the examples comes from the New Testament. And Brother David already mentioned it. In the introduction, Jesus took business people and taught them to preach and serve. In other words, Jesus took business everyday folks and taught them theology. Teach them how to serve, teach them how to preach. Now we are in a position, we have so many theologians. We have so many preachers that do not have business skills. So now we have to teach them how to live. We have to teach them church management. We have to teach them a, a not-for-profit management. Now, the disciples had a very acute sense of how world, the world worked around them. For example, Jesus calls him and tells him, you are fishermen. What I want you to do is use the skills that you acquire in a lifetime for fishing and become fishermen of men. In other words, God wants us to take the secular skills that we learn uh, an entire lifetime, use those skills in managing the church success successfully. So if somebody comes from outside and is an accountant or is an economist or is a banker, those roles fit perfect in a church environment to serve in an accounting function, to serve in the financial committee. Yeah. So it just makes sense if Jesus used the discipleship, the disciples, and use their training, use their secular skills they acquired in a lifetime to use it for the kingdom of God. So are we to do also. Now, there are many things that actually converge when it comes to not-for-profit and for-profit corporations. The structure might be the same, but there are things that actually set them apart. So a few things that set apart a for-profit corporation versus a not-for-profit. Number one, a not-for-profit has tighter resources. In plain terms, has less money. 
and less funds. A not-for-profit is often volunteer driven. Smaller corporation may not have afford any full-time employees. So there are corporations, there are churches, there are not-for-profit corporations that rely solely on volunteers. Also, the not-for-profit corporations, when it comes to measuring success, those success measuring tools are less obvious. On a corporation that is for profit, you look at the end of year statement and uh, the answers are obvious. Are we making money or we're not making money? Are we losing money or we have money in the bank? Not so when it comes to not-for-profit. And also one issue that we uh, face at the not-for-profit, there are no established practices for maximizing the results. And when I say this, there's not a book somewhere where there are listed 10 principles or 12 steps in which if you apply, you will obtain better results. And this is due in part of the geographical position, is due in part of the, the spiritual side, which we said that we're not emphasizing, we're not talking about this uh, in this lesson. But there are many factors for which we cannot establish a certain practice to go by to maximize the, the results, to maximize and, and to be a successful uh, corporation. Talk about mission statement. No matter of the corporation, for profit or not for profit, you have to have a mission statement. A short sentence in which anybody come, coming from outside could read, and as soon as he reads, they know exactly who you are and what you exist for. That mission statement is supposed to be one sentence, supposed to be very simple, has to be concise, has to be short, and when it comes to not-for-profit, has to be motivational, and has to be catchy, has to be catchy. Now, uh, I envision when I prepared this material, a house full here. So I envision at least 10 people listening in here. So I was gonna propose to take about three to five minutes, like a little lab and go over and create an operational mission statement. Examples of mission statements, Teen Mania, the Teen Mania is a, a Christian a corporation, it's a Christian, Christian entity that came up with this mission statement to provoke a young generation to passionately pursue Jesus Christ and to take his life-giving message to the end of the to the end of the earth. It's it's awesome. I mean, it's first of all, it's pursuing Jesus before you go and take the message. You gotta pursue Jesus, you gotta know him, and then to take his life-giving message to the end of the earth. You could have said, take his message, but the fact that he had his life-giving. It's a message of hope. It's a message of gives life. Mission statement of the Saddleback Church in California. And again, uh, this book was written on Saddleback Church and uh, 40 Days of Purpose, Purpose Driven Life was preached about and was talked about in nearly every church across the Americas. So their mission statement sounds like this, to bring people to Jesus and membership, very important. So to bring people to Jesus, and not only Jesus, but they also, they wanted members in their church, all right? So to bring people to Jesus and membership in his family. And after you bring them to Jesus and they are members of the back Church, to develop them to Christ-like maturity and equip them for the ministry in the church and in life mission in the world. And all this, the purpose is to magnify God's name, magnify his name. 
It's a very nice mission statement. Now, when it comes to mission statement, we, there, there are a few practical advices that we need to make. Um, we have to go over it and, and, and refine it several times. It's not a one-time occurrence. But basically what we need to do is, first of all, it's find godly counsel. Ask around, ask people that have developed mission statements before. There's nothing uh, against any privacy or nothing to hide when you create a mission. Uh, if necessary, form a task force, assign certain people that have certain uh, abilities to develop that mission statement and to formulate it in such a way that will be impactful, impactful will be short and be meaningful. If you are part of another mission, follow the larger mission mission statement. Make sure you don't conflict with the mission statement of the larger mission. Focus on goal. And everybody that did so far did very good. They focus on goals, on, on purpose, on scope. What do they exist for? Eventually, we have to finish the mission statement in one sentence. And if need be, facilitate the feedback. If somebody comes up with another suggestion, consider that suggestion and finalize it slowly, not like abruptly. Just finalize it slowly and usual. A mission statement, they always put God as the final, as the final element in there to glorify, to magnify God's name. 